Hello, I'm Annie Larkin, Vice President and Director of Community Engagement of the Amarin Museum. Welcome to Ambivalent Indigeneity, How Misre Misrepresentations in News Media Past Prevent Authentic Representation of Indigenous Identity and Issues in the Present with Professor Melissa Green Bly. Before we begin the program today, I want to acknowledge that Amarind is located in southeastern Arizona on lands where the Otham, Hopi, Oshwi, Yoeme, and Apache families have lived for untold generations and whose wisdom and traditions live on today in vibrant communities. We are grateful for what all these communities, rich in history, have to teach us. And thank you to our members and donors who enable Amarin to provide free online programming and to fulfill Amarin's mission of promoting the knowledge and understanding of the Native peoples of the Americas through research, education, conservation, and community engagement. To learn how you can assist Amarin in supporting its mission and programs by becoming a member or donor, please visit amarin.org. And on January 29th at 11 a.m., Amarin will host the free online lecture, The Origin of Our Extinction, the 1851 Yellow Fever Epidemic and the Hiached Otham with Professor David Martinez. Please visit the event section of Amarin's Facebook page or website for online program registration details. All right, Dr. Melissa Green Bly is an Associate Professor of Journalism at the University of Kansas William Allen White School of Journalism and Mass Communications. Also affiliate faculty at the KU Indigenous Studies Program. Melissa worked as an anchor and reporter during 20 years in the news business, covering local news and television markets, big and small. She enjoys using her knowledge and experience to educate the newest generation of journalists. Melissa is an enrolled citizen of the Miami Nation her research examines journalistic representations and negotiations of American Indian identity, past and present. Most recently, her work has been published in Journalism History. She has presented research at the American Journalism Historians Association Annual Conference, as well as the Joint Journalism Conference held in New York City each year. And to let our audience know, if you would like to ask any questions during the program today, please utilize the Q&A chat box located at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and we'll be gathering those to share with our speaker after the presentation. And also a link to, to a recording of today's program will be sent to all of our Zoom registrants later today. And with that, I would like to welcome Melissa Greenfly. Thank you for joining us today, Melissa. Absolutely, thank you so much for inviting me and thank everybody for taking time out of their day on a weekend. Um, to be here. Lots of ground to cover. Um, and bear with me, you um, heard mentioned that I was an anchor reporter, so I always joke when I do these presentations. Um, I'm used to having a producer and a director, and of course I am a one-woman show, so I will be screen sharing in and out, so we'll navigate that as we go. This morning we're really going to be examining the how and the why um, Native nations, issues, and individuals are often misrepresented or overlooked in news coverage um, from non-Native news sources and sources outside of Indian country. I'll use some examples from recent high-profile news stories to look at the contrast between that story in Native and non-Native news outlets. Um, also talk about some of the challenges faced by Indigenous media outlets and journalists as they seek to tell their own stories. And then I'll conclude with some resources that are designed to help non-Native journalists improve their coverage of Indian country. Um, and also talk about a new program that is aimed at training and equipping young Native journalists to cover issues facing their tribal nations um, with an eye toward countering those misrepresentations that really do continue to plague coverage of Native issues, identity, and individuals. So speaking in broad terms, News media often fail to offer authentic, accurate representations of Native American communities and individuals. Sometimes that's through simple failure to cover important issues that are facing those Native nations and individuals. Other times it's through a tendency to rely on culturally programmed default narratives regarding those nations and individuals. Media portrayals of Native Americans at worst are often based on old stereotypes and at best, often inadvertently perpetuate those stereotypes. 
And that's largely in part because Native people are not given voice in their own stories. Naming and labeling um, are an important part of the way news media often fail to accurately and authentically represent those Native individuals and communities, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Historian Jacques Barzon absolutely points out that much of what we think about as factual history is the result of limitations imposed by that convention of naming and characterizing. And so if we can accept that meaning can be found in a culture's language and systems of representation, we can pursue what media historian James Carey describes as a cultural history of journalism. And that really is simply a move away from those traditional great man narratives, um, the typical biographies of war heroes and elected leaders um, that are most often told from a Eurocentric perspective. And we can move towards scholarship that offers critical examination of the process of reporting. And in doing so positions journalism as a text with the power to shape social consciousness. Carey is seconded by the concept of cultural materialism um, put forth by Raymond Williams. And that simply argues that studying media texts um, is a credible way to understand and evaluate power dynamics, um, both historically and in the current moment. So media messaging contributes to the process in important ways specifically by molding, not necessarily creating, public opinion for or against certain um, policies or persons, also by contributing constructions of group identity um, and group consensus. And in the United States, newspapers served as a major instrument of nation building. Over decades and centuries, news media helped to define what it meant to be American. Uh, by default, defining who belonged, and more importantly, who did not. Benedict Anderson posits that mass media contribute to that notion of nation um, through the creation of imagined communities. Um, media, through the use of stereotypes and through processes such as omission, trivialization, and condemnation, um, contribute to an individual's construction of who they are or are not, um, really their sense of identity, and can offer a sense of belonging, often in opposition to a defined construction of other. Um, 19th century newspaper framing of American Indians as a problem that needed to go away, um, or as people who needed to be civilized through assimilation, taught newspaper readers that to be American meant supporting policies which furthered American progress. Um, and give me a moment to share. There's an image that really sums up what that progress should look like. Um, this um, well-known image, um, American Progress by John Gast, you see this westward push of what is considered civilization, um, Columbia representing American progress, holding a book and a telegraph line and railroads and transportation and settlers um, with Native Americans being pushed forward and essentially Columbia bringing the light into the darkness. Um, and this was an image that newspapers embraced um, through the texts and imagery that they put forward. Um, but that support for progress meant either turning a blind eye toward government's mistreatment of Indian nations um, or a willingness to justify that mistreatment by adopting an end justifies the means mindset. Um, that was offered by images and stories of the quote, savages um, who were a danger to women, children, and frankly, anyone and everyone. Um, it's worth noting that the term manifest destiny, first used in print in 1845, is credited to newspaper editor John O'Sullivan. Um, there is debate amongst historians, some of whom say that essay was actually penned by Jane Casno. I'm going to stop sharing there for just a minute. Um, both viewpoints, though, extermination and assimilation were employed in the history of our nation's journalism, often in tandem with shifts um, in governmental Indian policy 
and also whether Native nations were complying um, with those United States policies. So this good Indian, bad Indian dichotomy that was created in the 19th century press really carried over also into the 20th century. Um, and again, looking at some examples from that, let's see, here we go. Um, I wanted to just show you some visual examples and some textual examples. So um, toward the end of the 19th century, you know, and into the early 20th, the popularity of dime novels um, really starting to build that Western mythology. Um, and you see here the Kit Carson fighting trapper to the rescue, battling these savages back. Um, around the time 1890 is where you see the timeline for this Sitting Bull Killed headline. There was a real push to resolve the issue of Native nations. Um, and many people don't realize that um, L. Frank Baum, who famous for writing The Wizard of Oz, was also a newspaper editor during this time. And he wrote two editorials um, absolutely in support of exterminating Native nations, essentially arguing that so much harm had been done that Americans would never be able to live without fear of retaliation. Um, and then there's also a lot of play on words that gets introduced. This record keeper sends them away without feathers is talking about Indian policy around allotment when native um, communal lands were broken into individual plots. Um, suddenly it's become fashionable to be an Indian and Kent Carter has to resist countless emotional demands. In his words, he sends most people away, quote, without a feather in their cap. Um, the issues around allotment and belonging in native nations and citizenship are very complex. And throughout the decades and centuries, those um, difficulties of those issues are overlooked, um, preferring instead these easy play on words, conjuring up simplified um, imagery around native issues. Um, and then moving a little bit later, um, you see MacArthur poses with his Indian warriors. Um, natives were recognized post-World War II for the contributions they had made to the war effort, but again, not quite given that autonomy. Um, they are his, and they're not soldiers, they're warriors. It's again, the imagery and the wording um, that is chosen intentionally and which would be different if these were non-native um, soldiers being portrayed. Uh, there was also policies of urbanization coming out of World War II and into the 50s and 60s. Real Indians soon to call city home. Cleveland is going to get some new Indians, but this is no baseball story. Honest engine, these will be real Indians. Um, and they're talking about the fact that this program is going to bring um, Native individuals from reservations into Cleveland um, as part of this urbanization program. First to arrive, probably before another moon goes by, will be an 18-year-old maiden from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in the Dakotas. Headquarters TP here, first smoke signals. Um, in the powwow that followed, um, all of this, and they refer also later in the article to the Great White Father, um, just as they did in the 19th century press when referring to the President of the United States. Um, and then you see the image um, from the Alcatraz um, takeover um, and the imagery there as um, we do start to see a bit more autonomy on the part of Native nations who are seeking to have a voice, but that doesn't always mean the representation um, represented their voice. Um, so let me catch up with where I was. Journalism historian John Coward talks about this um, in his seminal work on representations of Native Americans in the 19th century press. He says, even in moments when the tone of news coverage was not negative, it still fell short. He says 19th century journalists could be sympathetic to Indians from time to time, but they could not render Native Americans as fully realized individuals from cultures as valuable and as important as their own. And Coward goes on to note that even in moments when Native leaders or citizens are heard from in their own words, they didn't have control over the presentation or editing of those words. 
Um, in some ways, that continues to be a challenge even today. Um, and we'll see that as we examine um, some contemporary examples here in just a moment. But what happens is too often stories about Native communities and individuals that capture the attention of major national news outlets aren't news to those communities and individuals that are affected, um, meaning the issues and challenges that are receiving attention have been ongoing for years, if not generations. So when a Native-centric story makes national headlines, it is typically because it is part of a larger non-Native narrative. Um, Dr. Sandy Grand, who is director of the Center for Critical Study of Race and Ethnicity at Connecticut College, examined that dynamic at work um, in the non-Native press coverage of um, the Dakota Access Pipeline in 2016. And citing analysis from the Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, which is an organization that advocates for diverse um, viewpoints in news, um, Grand pointed out how the hashtag no dapple warrior um, representation overshadowed the Lakota peoples and indigenous water protectors um, as major news outlets focused on the story as really a clash between protesters, um, not protectors, um, agitators and trespassers who were engaged in a clash uh, with Morton County officials and energy transfer partners. And those false equivalences between unarmed peaceful protectors and heavily armed officers and their billionaire corporate backers um, really can only be drawn through erasures of history and power. Um, it served to frame the story as a negative versus a positive, and it highlighted the oppositional elements instead of the proactive ones and the protective ones. So it emphasized the objection to the pipeline rather than the goal of saving and protecting the region's water supply. And you can see that in the imagery um, that, that was there during those moments. And I'm gonna show you a couple of those different images. So this was an image that found its way into many, many mainstream um, non-native national outlets. Um, these moments of um, tear gas and or um, those gathered being, you know, water hosed, et cetera. Um, great imagery and powerful stories, but not the whole story and definitely not um, from the perspective of those who were there. As they are saying, very front and center, we are here to protect water. And less often in non-native outlets did we see this imagery and this kind of wording um, and this type of framing for the story. It was all about the clash and not as much about the messaging around resource protection. And very few outlets provided any historical context into the lands that were in question and also other issues of um, resources on native lands. So, um, the Native American Journalists Association does a media spotlight report. And in 2020, um, their report really reinforced the need to seek out appropriate sourcing when covering indigenous peoples and communities. Um, in an analysis of news coverage by five national uh, news outlets in the United States, Naja researchers concluded, a lot of the stories we reviewed included placing people in the past and official heavy interviewing versus talking to those impacted in communities. Sadly, there were not a lot of indigenous journalists reporting on indigenous issues within the sample. We feel had there been more indigenous authors, these stories would have included more inclusive community sourcing. And so it is findings like that that really reinforce this belief that non-native um, media outlets are not equipped to accurately cover stories in Indian country. Um, and effective efforts to change that are coming, but they are slow in coming. Um, a frequently cited example of this is news coverage of a 2016 case um, involving a now seven-year-old Choctaw girl um, who had been placed with a white foster family. The story made national news um, 
there was a very stark contrast in the tone of the coverage based on who is telling that story. So KGO TV, the ABC affiliate in San Francisco, headlined its coverage on March 20th, 2016. Indian Child Welfare Act separates foster daughter from Santa Clarita family. Going on to tell readers on its website, quote, in photos, they're a happy family, but Sunday could be the worst day for the lives of Rusty and Summer Page and their six-year-old foster daughter, Lexi. The story notes that Lexi is 1.5% Choctaw. Quote, because of that, her case fell under the Indian Child Welfare Act, a federal law passed in the 1970s that aims to protect the best interests of Native American children and promote stability of tribal families. Well, that same week, in a news story dated March 22 of 2016, Indians.com ran a story headlined, Anti-Indian Child Welfare Act Attorney takes on another dispute. This article offered a lot more detailed explanation of the facts of this case, um, explaining that the case had been ongoing for two years, that the Foster family knew that for some time that Alexandria P., the child they called Lexi, fell under the guidelines of ICWA, and that the father had been pursuing his parental rights for several years leading up to Lexi's removal from the Page home. And if you look again at the imagery um, around this story, so the images here of this family are what the television station had on their website to show their viewers and readers how upsetting this was for this family to lose this foster child. What we don't see in any of their coverage is um, the perspective from the Native family and how it affected them to have lost Alexandria in the first place um, and, and what the price was for them in pursuing this action in order to have her placed back with her father. We don't learn a lot of that circumstance. Um, and so when you think about, again, just as we were talking about with DAPL, the broader historical context, before the passage of ICWA, generations of Native children had been taken from their communities, first by missionaries and government officials and later by social workers, but all representatives of a government that believed assimilation into the dominant society through adoption, foster care, or education in off-reservation boarding schools was in the long-term best interest of those children. And those policies of placing Indian children in non-Indian homes and families served to perpetuate the assimilationist policies of the 19th and 20th centuries, which resulted in a de facto ethnicide of the values, attitudes, and customs um, as those native children were forced to substitute Euro-American values, language, and dress for their traditional ones. So anthropologist Pauline Turner Strong, in drawing a comparison between modern day legal cases challenging ICWA and those colonial era captivity narratives that were made popular in early American books and newspapers, points once again to the importance of connecting the past with the present in any news coverage of native issues, noting that problematic coverage that results when non-native media outlets fail to understand and appreciate the strength of those historical memories. So the need to provide this critical historical context is an important way that news media could include the native perspective in coverage of issues affecting native communities. So it's also important to acknowledge issues of American Indian identity are complex and often controversial. Lakota scholar Hillary Weaver argues that it's because there's little agreement on precisely what constitutes an indigenous identity, how to measure it, and who truly has it. Um, the constitution of that identity is further complicated by a lack of consensus on correct terminology. Do we use Indian, American Indian, Native American, Indigenous with a capital I, um, Indigenous lowercase i? Issues of determination and labeling um, are problematic within individual tribal communities as well as within 
broader native community. And that is why that issue of sovereignty and self-determination is so important and so often is lost in non-native news coverage of these issues. Um, but these complications perhaps make it understandable that non-native scholars and journalists struggle in this regard. It's more difficult to understand why they repeatedly fail to reach out to sources that can point them in the right direction. One of the easiest sources for information about covering Native issues is the Native American Journalists Association. And a quick trip to the NAJA website offers multiple resources um, to both Native and non-Native journalists um, with their coverage of newsworthy issues affecting Native communities. Um, one of the favorites is the bingo card that they've created that's available on their website. Um, so it's called Bingo, Reporting in Indian Country Edition. And it aims to help reporters and editors recognize when they are relying on cliched storytelling or stereotypes. Um, and if you look at some of the topics, um, alcohol, horses, um, you've got poverty, diabetes, casino, um, reservation, um, spirits or ghosts. So what they're saying is if you are able in your story to connect the squares to make bingo, you need to go back and revisit the story you're telling and your purpose in telling that particular story. Um, it's really just to offer an opportunity to pause and reflect on whether um, the story that you're presenting has the full perspective and context that it requires to address those issues. Nausea also offers um, an AP style guide to educate journalists about use of the terms indigenous, tribe, Indian, among others. Um, noting that best practices mean it is always preferable when possible and appropriate to use a specific tribal nation name in lieu of blanket labels such as Native American or American Indian. So, and once again, considering um, Barzan's discussion around the limitations posed by our need to name and characterize, it's worth considering whether journalists who are trained to write clearly and concisely feel uncomfortable using language they find to be awkward or unfamiliar, or that they consider to be difficult or confusing for their audience. Too often when a specific nation is named, it is because it carries a sense of familiarity for the intended audience. Names such as Lakota, Navajo, or Cherokee, while other less familiar or more difficult names are left unsaid. Um, so there seems to be an unwritten assumption in the broader media industry that ongoing coverage of Indian country is the sole purview of tribal news outlets and native journalists. And that is because of what we talked about with the Nausea Reading Red Report and their Media Spotlight Report just a few moments ago. But that assumption is problematic for multiple reasons, because while it is clear that finding credible and appropriate Native sources is crucial to improving reporting on the issues that are facing Native communities. Um, we also consider that an emphasis on demanding that it must be a Native journalist covering Native issues may have unintended consequences for those journalists. Many Native scholars, artists, professionals feel a responsibility to give back to or to advocate for their respective communities. Doing so is certainly an important and off-needed use of time and talents, but when a Native person excels in their chosen field without making their work explicitly about their lived experience, we have to consider how we choose to identify that individual. Must they always identify as Native American um, before identifying with their chosen field? So for example, a Navajo doctor versus a doctor who happens to be Navajo. Um, the danger being that work done by Native journalists on topics other than those directly affecting Native communities might be overlooked. And that can result in the professional pigeonholing of that journalist. So failing to recognize that Native journalists are journalists first 
meaning they share the same training and skill set as a non-native journalist and are equipped to report on any story is ultimately another way of silencing them, particularly when native individuals are disproportionately missing um, in the employment stats of most newsrooms. Another problematic issue resulting from that emphasis on native journalists covering native issues um, brings us back to the need to once again, acknowledge that the term Native American or American Indian is generic. There are nearly 600 federally recognized tribal nations alongside other nations who are not federally recognized living within the borders of the United States. To assume a journalist simply because they are native can be the voice for all native issues nullifies the unique histories and experiences of those individual indigenous communities while simultaneously reinforcing the generic Indian stereotype by failing to recognize that different native communities and individuals have divergent views on issues affecting their own community, as well as about issues pertinent to um, the larger native community in mass. So for many native journalists, it is an ongoing struggle to find a balance, um, recognizing the need to tell stories from an indigenous perspective um, that are relevant to specific tribal communities, while also fighting to have non-native news outlets recognize the news value in those same stories. And economics certainly factor into that picture. Um, as bleak as the current budget outlook is for mainstream media outlets, economic sustainability has always been a challenge for native news outlets. Independent outlets struggle to survive. And while some do benefit from tribal funding, that also sometimes means tribal journalists feel pressured to appease tribal leadership, um, which can influence which stories are covered, how they're covered, and in extreme cases, um, can prompt outright censorship. So that legacy of ambivalence as it relates to representation of native nations, issues, and individuals really does continue to manifest today. And the legacy of long gone editors and reporters lives on. And as we've talked about, leads to some challenges for native journalists. Um, so a great deal could be accomplished by giving native nations and communities more voice in their own stories. And to make that come to fruition, we really have to be willing to reconsider and redefine what we think we know about what it means to be Native American, starting with the labels we choose in describing individuals who are citizens of Native nations. It requires us to reevaluate the history we know and the stories we tell ourselves about the people and events that led us to where we are today. It will also require adjustments and improvements in the way we train journalists with an eye toward telling more inclusive, um, more authentic stories in the future. An important way to meet that goal is to ensure the visibility of indigenous media outlets and through including those outlets and the journalists who work for them in the broader discourse of journalism as it is practiced in the United States. And um, I'm, I guess, close to the end. So I wanna wrap up by telling you about a couple of things that um, we're doing at KU that I'm really excited about. Um, because we do see these challenges and we do want to make a difference. And so I'm really excited to say that this summer we're launching a summer workshop um, aimed at bringing in um, indigenous high school journalists, um, our students who are interested in being journalists and connecting them with practicing um, journalists through the Native American Journalists Association to start really growing that next generation of native journalists and showing them what's possible and, and training them to tell stories from their communities. And another thing that we are doing in the next year is launching a native student-led news program um, to tell some of those stories, not only in our geography, but across Indian country. So it's going to take efforts like that in training that next generation of native journalists and also educating that next generation of non-native journalists how to improve and close some of these gaps that we've talked about today um, to really make a difference long-term in providing more authentic, um, well-rounded stories on Native issues, communities, and individuals. So thank you, and I am happy to answer any questions. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Melissa. That was an absolutely fabulous presentation. Um, we do have questions. Uh, first is, what are some of the recent news stories that you feel the press has ignored uh, regarding Native communities? That's a, <laughs> that's a challenge. You know, we all have been seeing so much coverage um, of COVID and the pandemic. And there certainly have been, especially early on in our, our first wave of, of COVID before we had Delta and Omicron, there were some nods to how that was affecting Native communities. But most of those stories were victim of that parachute journalism that I touched on during the presentation, which is they don't have ongoing relationships with those communities and with journalists who are covering those communities on a daily basis. So they pop in to show you, quote, how bad things are on the reservation. Um, and they focused on issues of, again, the poverty, the lack of um, Wi-Fi, the lack of running water, you didn't see stories about native first responders and frontline workers who were doing amazing and positive things to help their communities navigate that pandemic. Those were fewer and farther in between, and you saw much more of that out of native news outlets. So that is one example. There are a ton of stories happening right now around um, environmental issues and impact. Um, there are many organizations across Indian country who are designed to be protectors of those resources, not only on specific reservations, but because of the significance of the larger impact of resource depletion. And you don't see a lot of those stories um, in non-native news. Um, I would also say that if you were to spend maybe a month, maybe a week, if it's a big um, election cycle, comparing coverage of issues that are important during an election or the priorities that an administration should have in a non-native news outlet with a native news outlet, you would see a stark contrast in what those priorities um, should be. Our next question is, do you find these same type of stereotypes and imagery go across the world regarding representation of Native communities? It's interesting, and that is an area I have on my list to spend more time in, um, in international journalism. I will tell you, in the times that I have come across international sourcing, um, there does seem to be some of that there. There was um, in Germany in a certain era, and it, I think it must have been coming out of the end of the 19th century into the early 20th. Um, if you can imagine the era of um, the Wild West shows, they were, um, some of them traveling internationally and sort of um, marketing merchandising that um, Western myth. Um, there was definite representation in German media that was very typical of what we would consider the um, Old West, Wild West mythology. Um, you do see, if you look going back to the colonial era, um, British newspapers that had a longer history prior to the American press being founded, um, you do still also see some of that um, representation of the savage, that this um, the, these native populations were a threat to be dealt with versus potential allies to be worked with. So I think, yes, you do find that internationally and historically. And are there books or resources that you could recommend to our audience to uh, further their educational journey on this topic? Oh, heavens, I should have been prepared. There are so many. Um, I definitely would encourage anybody just to go spend some time on the Native American Journalist Association website under their resources tab, um, just to see some of the things that are there. I think spending time examining um, some Native news, whether that's Indian Country Today or Native News Online, going to a specific tribal outlet, um, and just looking at the way they're doing journalism and the stories they're covering. Um, 
gosh, I could give you probably a list of 100 books. Um, I mentioned John Coward. He is um, a media historian colleague. Um, I would almost consider him mentor. And his book is one of the definitive. It's the 19th century. It's the newspaper Indian. And he's examining 19th century representations and he does a really effective job of just surveying that whole good Indian, bad Indian dichotomy and why that happened. He also had a follow-up book where he examines, the focus is on um, visual imagery of Indians in media, um, which is also really good. I will also say uh, the um, National Museum of the American Indian on their website, if you go to some of the archives in their past exhibitions, um, they had an entire exhibition around imagery of Indians um, in advertising and film, and you can click and find the visuals that supported that exhibit. And it's really great because if you click, for example, on the old Land of Lakes butter logo, it'll give you kind of the history and detail about that logo. Um, that, that one has since been changed. So resources like that abound um, and are worth spending time in. And do you find the press also represent other communities in a similar manner as they do Native communities? For sure. Um, issues of marginalization and, and lack of um, authentic or fully embodied representation have plagued many, many groups over the course of our media history. Um, when I teach our diversity in media course, we not only discuss representation of um, African Americans and the Black community, we talk about um, Latino, Latina, Latinx representation, Asian American representation. Um, and we also talk about other ways that we fail to fully represent groups. We talk about um, generational differences. We talk about um, stereotypes around uh, socioeconomic status. So age, um, finances, uh, regionally, right? We love stereotypes of um, these shortcuts, as Walter Lippmann described them, to understand what people from the South are like or what people from the Northeast are like. Um, so absolutely, there are so many different groups um, and issues that have fallen subject to what Tuckman puts forward as that omission, trivialization, and condemnation process through media. And can you talk about how indigenous, the ind American indigenous population is described in the dawn of everything? And what do you think about their approach? Um, I don't know that I can discuss that. Is that the dawn of everything? I'm assuming is a specific text? Yes, it is. Okay. I am going to just tell you, I do not even want to try without spending more time in it to answer that, but I'd be happy to follow up with someone. But of course, totally understandable. And our next question is, across the Western world and especially Canada, how does success with uh, American Indian reporters in those countries compare to that of the U.S.? Ooh, um... I will tell you what I know of that. And there are scholars who that is their wheelhouse and absolutely where they spend their time and energy. Um, from, a, from a United States perspective, right? First Nations, we see more happening in Canada, um, more overt coverage, but we also see um, more challenges. So the sense of that is there seems to be a very active um, journalistic community there, but I think that if you talk to them, they will tell you they experience some of the same challenges that I've discussed as it relates to um, that dichotomy between Native and non-Native press here um, and how those issues are represented and framed. Um, because there has been such a long history of interaction 
um, around policy and government actions toward First Nations. Um, globally, when we say Indigenous, um, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association is an amazing group of scholars that cover issues around um, Indigenous communities globally. I think you see some active Indigenous media, uh, for example, in Australia and across Central and South America. But my sense is in talking with some of the scholars in that organization, they still would tell you they sense some of these same struggles and challenges. Um, and economics also a factor um, globally for Indigenous media outlets. Melissa, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Absolutely. We, we truly appreciate you sharing your time and knowledge with us. And I'd like to also thank our audience for joining us today. And we hope that you'll be able to join us again for Amron's next online program on January 29th. Again, thank you, Melissa. And thank you to our audience for joining us. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.